You are listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us Sundays at 10 a.m. in person or online, or Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. In this podcast, we're going through the books 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John with Linda Sims. Last week of strengthening our relationship with God, we're on John, the 3rd, 3rd John. And our teachers, Dr. Evans, there's information about him. Here's our opening question. Have you ever learned something by watching someone else do it? Maybe ride a bike, play a sport or a video game. Anyone learn anything? Why was it helpful to have someone show you rather than tell you how to accomplish your goal? We learn what? We learn by example, visual person. What came to mind for me was something simple, threading a needle and then tying a knot in the end of the thread. You're supposed to take that thread and rub it in your finger and then pull and it makes a knot. But my mom could tell me that till I was blue in the face. I had to see her do it to learn how to do it. It's because picture's worth a thousand words, isn't it? In this session, we're going to look at two men One will show us how to live out everything that John's talked about in the last two letters, and the other is going to give us a very real example of what happens when a believer refuses to listen to God's Word. So let's take a look at our scripture. Third John, there's only 15 verses tonight. We should get through it pretty quickly, shouldn't we? (laughs) Here we go. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. This time John's writing to a person, not a church. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. Remember last week we looked at facts and truth, and so here we're seeing connection there. Testify to your truth how you're doing that. Okay, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason... If I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Let's look at our video. It only has 15 verses, but it makes a very strong point. 
the attitude that you and I must have as part of the family of God. Because you see, you can be in the family and not have the right attitude about the family. He writes to his dear friend, Gaius, who he compliments as loving the truth and whom he loved in the truth. Why? Because truth brings people together. He says to them that I'm, I'm praying for you and I'm praying that your physical well-being prospers just like your soul prospers. That's a great lesson there. Don't let your spiritual life lag behind your physical life, financial life, career life, because when you flip it, when the spiritual takes back seat to the physical, you are regressing in your Christian experience, not progressing. There's a lot out there today that's taking Christians in the wrong direction by making all the wrong things the first thing. Remember, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Put the spiritual before the physical or the material. So he writes his friend. He expresses his joy, his joy that folks are walking in the truth, that they're living in light of God's reality, as this friend most certainly was. Well, he's concerned that they are going to be visitors to the church authorized by the apostles who may not get a good welcome. And this is because there is a guy in the church who is uh, not good to work with. This guy is not a compliment to the kingdom of God. Diotrephes is uh, the first tyrant of the church. He wants to rule with an iron rod. Instead of being a welcoming environment, he wants to dismiss those who he doesn't like or doesn't agree with. And John wants to make it known that that's not the attitude of gratitude that God's people should have toward God or toward his family because he views his family as very important. And so he writes in verse 9, I write something to the church. He says, Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, I call attention to his deeds, which he does and unjustly accusing us with wicked words. He was a man who was bringing division to the church, something that we must not accept. When we see illegitimate division, some things you've got to divide on because truth and error must have a divide. But when you see people rejecting the truth, he says they rejected what we've taught, then you know that that cannot go unaddressed. So he writes his friend and says, look, don't skip this. Don't ignore people in the congregation and leaders in the congregation who are sowing discord and not creating a welcoming environment for the family of God. That's what Satan wants. You know, he's the great divider. He divides families and he divides God's family. Many times in scripture, God has had to call people to preserve the unity of the church. You know what unity is? It's oneness of purpose. I'm standing recording today on a football field. And the only way that the team scores touchdowns if they're on one accord. The moment that one player jumps offside, the whole team is penalized because one person can affect the unity of the whole. And that's why John had no problem calling out one person because he knew that this could affect the atmosphere, particularly if they're a leader of the whole church. And that's why you want to make sure your leaders not only are committed to the truth, but are walking in the truth. I mean, this brother could have been uh, citing Bible verses all day long, but how he was walking, that is how he was treating people, was not in line with the truth. And so John goes on and he speaks to his friend. He says in verse 11, beloved, that's an intimate term of affection. He says, do not imitate what is evil. Don't be drawn into this, but do what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. That is, they're not looking in the light. They're not seeing who God is and how God feels and what God does. And if they're not imitating God, I don't care how much Bible they know, because their heart, their spirit, and their walk is inconsistent. 
This is when he contrasts the troublemaker with another gentleman, Demetrius, in verse 12. He has received the good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. Why did he have to say that? Because he knows that when Demetrius comes to the church, he's gonna run into our friend. <laughs> he's gonna run into the atrophies and he's gonna run into a problem. So he wants his friend Gaius to intervene and make sure that the troublemaker does not create an unwelcome environment to the authorized person the apostles are sending to minister at the church. How we receive guests, how we treat each other, shows how we feel about God. How can you love God whom you've never seen? He says you have not seen God when you are despising authentic family members that you get to see. That's what the atrophies was doing. That's what God does not want done. And he wants leaders like Gaius under apostolic authority to make that declaration. So if you're in a church, if you're a leader of the church, you must preserve the unity of the church so that you're not penalized by God because people keep jumping offside. People keep doing their own thing when this is a team game. This is a team relationship. This is a spiritual family. He says, I have many things to write to you. I got a whole bunch I want to talk to you about. But in spite of that, I'm not willing to put it on a pin. I, I really, you know what? I'm coming to you shortly. You know why he's coming? He wants to make sure this guy is dealt with because he's concerned about the stability, well-being, unity of the church. Wherever Satan can cause disunity, he knows he's winning because he knows God is a unified being. Make sure you fight for legitimate unity. And the thing that keeps you unified is the truth. What does God say? How does God feel? And are we operating in light of it? When you're doing that, you're preserving unity. God will have some coffee and cookies with you. He's going to fellowship with you because fellowship for John is not just coffee, punch, and cookies in the fellowship hall. Fellowship for John is intimate affection between his people as a reflection of their intimate fellowship with him. Over the course of this series, we've honed in on John's pastoral heart. We've seen his passion for God's children, love for the people of God, and his zeal for truth. So here at the end of the series, we're gonna tighten the zoom just a little bit. Uh, Dr. Evans described 3 John as a postcard, not one written to a church this time, but to one of John's dear friends. And I, it's Gaius, I guess it is, instead of Gaius. So how does John greet Gaius? And how would you describe his relationship to this younger brother in Christ? With love and friendship, and I think he's proud of him. Good. Yeah, he says beloved Gaius, whom he loves in the truth. And he was a dear friend. They were united in their love for Christ and truth. And I think he was proud of him. He could trust him, couldn't he? Because he wrote to him. Given everything we've studied in John's letters about how to live as a Christian, what stands out to you about John's attitude here? He's got a good attitude. Yeah, he does. We need to be unified. We need to be unified. And he said over everything, we need to be unified over everything. In truth, in truth. When there's legitimate error, there's, there should be division. Uh, John talked about loving the children of God, and he also talked about encouraging others in holiness, which I think is what John, uh, George was trying to tell us. Let's look at the next, the, these couple verses here. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. 
What is John commending Gaius for in those verses? His treatment of the traveling teachers. Yeah, caring for um, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they were traveling, what we would call traveling missionaries today. How does John describe those people? What does he call them in that verse? Those verses. Does he say they're traveling missionaries? Brothers. Back there I heard something. Brothers, Brothers in truth. He, uh, I was looking for the word strangers. He calls them. Did you see that one in your verse? Maybe yours said brothers in truth. Strangers to you. They are brothers in the Lord, brothers in truth, but they were new to that congregation. So he called them strangers because they hadn't met them yet. Why is Gaius' behavior so compelling? Gaius in every way is carrying out the mission that John set his readers on in the first two letters that we've been studying. He welcomed people who were strangers to him because they were his brothers and sisters in Christ, and he equipped and sent them out with resources to continue to advance the truth. So this is what struck me. That, you know, it said he treated them in a manner worthy of them, uh, worthy of God. That struck me. Did that strike anyone else? That cho those choice of words there was a manner worthy of God because they're God's ministers, aren't they? And they're coming in the name of the Lord. Okay, just like today, not everything was peaceful in Gaius's world. So let's look at verses. Um, jumped, maybe I've jumped ahead. Yeah. What opportunities have you or do you have to care for God's people at church and your family, neighbors? Any chant, any examples? I think there's opportunities every day. There are. Every day. If he was here Sunday, you heard me talk about Arby's. Yes. And Pastor Aaron and I took Oliverio's food there yesterday and walked in, and it was overwhelming, the presence of God. And the management couldn't believe it. A young lady there, really broken, mm -hmm. got to pray with them. And uh, actually, there was two Arby's, and I ended up at the wrong one. <laughs> So we left, and it was a long story, but there, here there was a girl at both places that had been, had died and been brought back. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to leave partially some of the food at the first one and took the main course. The first place got Bonnie Bell, and the second place got the main mill. But there's people all around us at all times just looking, I mean, the harvest, the fields are ripe, but the labors are few. Do you think your heart's extra sensitive to them? Pastor, you, do you think your heart is... Oh, there's no question. Yeah. When I see the uh, people that are broken, people that are struggling, um, I just, I have a special place in my heart for helping people. I want to help people that want to help themselves. Now, I'm not too keen on helping people that just want to take a hand out. But if they'll take a hand up, I like to be a part of that. She mentioned a number of things there. She talked about checking on them, visiting them. Pastor took food course praying for him we can send cards we can phone him i i had written down here the night Mydra lost or not Mydra, karen lost her little dog buttons and all the she put on facebook how all the neighbors came together and helped her find her dog so there's lots of ways we just maybe need to slow down like we did at the beginning of the evening and listen to the lord could you hear that because i think that verse was important Especially as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to those in the household of faith. So let's go on to good comments. And the question is, how could you reach out to them this week? So maybe the comments have inspired us to maybe to reach out to some people around us to show them the love of God, to show that we care. You know, that's when we...
can really share Jesus when we have developed a relationship with someone and they know you really care, then their heart is open to hear what you have to say about the Lord. Okay, we're going to read um, a couple more verses, verses 9 and 10. Um, just like today, not everything was peaceful in Gaius' world. So let's look at these verses. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, un does unjustly, accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Let me get here. So we've got a question about this. John identifies a potential hitch in his plan to write to the church. What was it? Diotrephes, yeah. And he's resisting John and the apostles, isn't he? So in this session, Tony calls, called Diotrephes the first tyrant of the church. He kind of sounded like one, didn't he? He wanted the church to remain firmly under his control, and he went so far as to reject even the authority of Jesus' disciples, including John. So what charge does he have about, against him? He, that he's, I pressed it too fast. Diotrephes is being selfish, self-centered, self-focused, and he's advancing only himself, not the kingdom, is he, isn't he? Yes, illegitimate division. What did he call legitimate division, Mike? <laughs> when it's not the truth. When it's not the truth. When there's error in truth, you have to, that has to be divided. But if it's anything else, it's illegitimate division. Okay, so what else was Diotrephes rejecting? He rejected the apostles and John. What else was he rejecting? He was rejecting authority, which is good, and I don't have that answer here. I wish I did. <laughs> We are all under authority. Diotrephes, he said, was putting himself above God, which is what happens when there's a tyrant. They don't, they, they aren't submitted to authority over them. I, th I think the Holy Spirit does show us. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's an unsettling in our spirit whenever we run into that. It was a simpler answer, but I love your answers. He was rejecting the other brothers and sisters who were traveling, and he rejected anybody in the church, in his church who supported the people who came in. So it was kind of his way or the highway, wasn't it? A bit it does sound a bit, a bit narcissistic. Okay. So what does Diotrephes illustrate for us in light of John's letters? How not to act, exactly. <laughs> exactly, I'll put it up there. Those who refuse to love God's children therefore don't have the love of God at all, do they? When you don't love God's children... Gaius was the perfect example of how we should behave. He received people, he loved people, he ministered to people, he showed hospitality. Diotrephes was on the other side of that, who, was, who refused to do those things. So one of the sobering things about this short letter is how plainly it depicts the behavior that John has been warning against. We may not consider ourselves hateful people, but we certainly struggle with feelings of pride and self-centeredness. Or maybe that's only me. Is that only me? Okay. Have you ever found yourself itching to resist the authority of God's word or the leaders God has ordained for the church? Why or why not? He said yes as well. I, there was a time for me, it was years and years ago at a different church and years ago, so not this church and not our pastor, but I, I was upset with uh, the pastor. I saw things that were not right, and I talked to the Lord honestly about it, and I told the Lord everything, <laughs> what was upsetting me, I told him all about it. I told him I was so angry I could spit. <laughs> and I told him I didn't respect my pastor anymore. And you know what the Lord said to me? then respect his office. I knew it was the Lord. Those are weighty words, aren't they? 
So that's what I did. Uh, one of the trainings I had as a Christian school administrator told me, they said, you know, the board of the school is over you. And they said, um, if, the, if there ever comes a time that that board makes a decision that you just absolutely cannot support, you're supposed to resign. And I think those are wise words. Here's a couple verses I pulled out. 1 Corinthians 1.10 now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Romans 13, 1. Every person is to be subjection to the governing authorities. We were talking about that. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Verses 2 to 4 there go on to tell us that rulers are a cause for good behavior. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of them if we're doing the right thing, doing good behavior. And they're ministering, ministers of God for our good. Verse 5 went on to say, Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. Render to all that is due them. Tax to whom taxes do, due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Okay, let's look at this next one. We're going to look at a word in the Greek. Okay, when faced with the temptation to seize power, what do you do? I, I think a lot of times the temptation is to talk about it to other people. But I think the Lord would prefer we talk to him about it. You know, and then, you know, um, we'll talk more about that. That's why we walk in the light, isn't it? As soon as he shows us something, that's what walking in the light's all about. We learned in the very first uh, session, walking in the light, the, the way that's a revealer. The Lord reveals what's amiss in our heart, and we, our job is to just agree quickly with him, let him remove it and change us and grow us. We all do love God, and we love him in different ways. Okay, here's peeking at the Greek, talking wicked nonsense. Flulario is the word. That's the act of indulging in speech that makes no sense or needlessly disparages. Uh, John devotes the majority of this letters to the contrast between the behaviors of Gaius and Diotrephes, and that's what Rodney just mentioned. Gaius walks in deep hospitality and love for those around him, whereas the latter illustrates ungodly self-centeredness. By putting himself first, Diotrephes rejected the authority of John, which led to Diotrephes talking wicked nonsense against John and his disciples. That term, flulario, refers to the act of indulging in speech that makes no sense or needlessly disparages. John is making it clear that Diotrephes condemns the discipline of hospitality and seeks to dispose of those who offer it to others in the church. His ambition became an arrogant rejection of truth which led to false speech and rebellious behavior. Diotrephes is a case study of an ambitious individual who wanders from the Lord, an example we would do well to consider in our own lives. Um, if you've been in church for any length of time, chances are you've seen firsthand someone like Diotrephes. Not every tyrant is the pastor. Sometimes... This is from the leader's guide. Sometimes there's the person that's talking bad about the elder board or the worship leader. Sometimes they're the person who refuses to shake the hand of the African-American greeter in the lobby. Or sometimes they're the person who looks at their phone through the whole sermon. Okay, at the heart of Diotrephes' attitude, who is he most concerned with? Himself. himself. That's right. Himself. Solomon teaches us that uh, rebellion is worse than witchcraft. It does. It does teach us that. She said rebellion is worse than witchcraft. That would be a good study, Rita. <laughs> okay. How do you respond when faced with inconveniences in your church? What about people who inevitably make demands on your time? Well, here are the reasons that were given in the leader's guide. I'm too busy. I don't have the money, skills, or talent. 
It's not my gifting. We have a church program for that. Do those look vaguely familiar? Do you remember that slide we saw, probably session six, whenever I came up with reasons why we, obstacles to ministering to people? Lack of time. The, the slides six sessions ago, that, those are the ones the Lord told me those were lies. <laughs> those, those were lies to me because, you know, and there they are. They were the exact, the, these were in the leader's guide, but I didn't see that in session six. Um, and there were the scriptures that we studied at that time. That's why they should look so familiar to you because we already, we already had talked about them. So how do you respond let me see here. Yeah. What could you do in those instances to show love to God's people, to welcome them as brothers and sisters? And so uh, let's look at the first one. Someone talks bad about the elder board or the worship leader. What could we do instead? Right? Don't listen. Put the, put the fire out. Yeah, put the fire out. Put the fire out. Put it out. Don't, don't go along with it. it Come says, back with an encouraging word. Yeah, give an encouraging word. Good comments. A wise pastor once told me when someone would come to him, he would always say, am I part of the problem or part of the solution? And if I'm not either, you're, you don't need to talk to me about this. <laughs> That's what he would say to them. So, but we're not to receive an accusation against an elder except the scripture says on the basis of two or three witnesses and you know, most of us aren't in that place. Let's look at the next one. Someone refuses to shake the hand of the African American greeter in the lobby. What should we do instead? Be, be an example. How would you be an example, Leanne? Shake his hand, shake his hand. Yeah, love, greet, welcome everyone. Yeah, right, love, greet, welcome everyone. You know, I pulled up a couple of, scre- a couple of scriptures. Uh, greet, it, greet one another with a kiss of love. That's from First Peter. Um, and this, this scripture, it's gonna seem strange, but I believe the Lord have, have us, is having us look at it. Um, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called and put a child in front of himself and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives such one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. So he put, actually put a small child in front of him, but who are we in God's eyes? We're children, aren't we? We are all children. So I, we're not to put stumbling blocks in, you know, in our brother's past. And what about someone looks at their phone through the whole service? Instead, what kind of a person should we be? I hear, I didn't hear, pardon me? Attend to, attend to, listen, exactly. Give God and his word due respect and attention. Thank you, Bruce, for shouting. Leanne said we ought to send him a text, tell him turn her phone on. (laughs) I like that, I like that. Um, What the word says, we know this. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. So the Lord's worthy of our attention, isn't he? And then Isaiah 524 this one was kind of sobering. Therefore, as a tongue of fire consumes stubble and dry grass collapses into the flame, so their root will become like rot and their blossom a blow away as dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So does, does the Lord take his word should we take his word with seriousness? 
Yeah, and I think I love it that Pastor has a stand for the reading of the Word. We're, we're showing the Lord, we're honoring His Word, and we're honoring Him, because those are His words. Okay, as we finish out this little postcard of a book, John reminds Gaius not to follow in Diotrephes' footsteps. Why would it be tempting to do what Diotrephes did? The tyrant. We're, we're human, aren't we? This was a scripture I pulled up, and we'd already mentioned it. We battle, we battle with our flesh, fleshly desires. He said, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. So we have a, we're in a battle all the time. Um, and I know pastor's gonna do a whole series on the armor of God. We're, we need his armor. We need it every day. We need to apply it because we are in a battle. All right, check our time here. Okay, we're in good shape. Um, when you see people in the church focused on themselves, how do you respond? How much love do we put in our tank before we leave our house each day? Is it important to do that? How do we get love in our tank? We spend time with Jesus. I pulled up this verse because it came from 1 John. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin but not leading to death. Pray for him for one thing, don't we? Love on him. Pray for him. Um, and I pulled up, uh, let me see, well, let me go here. Here's the question. How do you deal with the temptation to imitate their bad behavior? It's not... It's, righteousness isn't, uh, we learn more unrighteousness than we do righteous, righteousness. When we spend time with someone who's doing the wrong thing, it's so easy to do the wrong thing. Um, that's why we tell our children, pick your friends carefully, don't we? Because we do that. But I've, I've got pulled up a couple of scriptures. Um, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, this is in 1 Corinthians 10, that our fathers were all under the cloud, they all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We, we've, if we receive Jesus, we're all God's children, and we all have the Holy Spirit, don't we? And we've been water baptized, most of us have. Um, they all ate the same spiritual food. We're doing that in church, aren't we? Eating from the word. They all drank the sp same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. We're taking that same drink. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we should not crave evil things as they also craved, or not to be idol idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and they were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. So we just have to stay humble and recognize we need the Lord every single day, don't we? That's why we hope the word word transforms our hearts, isn't it? So that we can do that. I had another scripture there. I'm not going to read it. But John concludes his letter by pointing out that both Gaius and Diotrephes received the exact same testimony from the exact same people. The information they were given was the same. What they did with it, however, was what mattered. Right? What they did with it was what mattered. So what will you do with what you've learned in this study in the letters of John? I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to be more sensitive. 
How will your life be different even this week as a result of the testimony of truth that you've heard and I've heard? He said he's going to, he and his family are going to go back through this study. And these, the videos we've been watching are on Right Now Media, aren't they, Pastor? Available to the church? So, I mean, there's lots of videos there. So that's, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's one thing to do, we could do. Here's another thing to think about. What would you like to change in your Christian life to grow closer in fellowship with God? You might just be answering these here. What obstacles will you face in that journey? And what can you do to deal with those obstacles? Well, the the obstacles is our own desires. You're right. It's our own heart. A thought I had earlier is true definition to me of love is when you do something for somebody that you know they're not in a position to do anything for you. You know what I'm saying? As far as giving... If you're giving to someone just to get it back, you know, when you go help somebody that really is not in a place to help you uh, financially, you know, but that thank you, that encouraging word that they may give you back is really all you would ask for, you know. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It does make sense. Thank you, Pastor. This journey through John has taken us into the very heart of our Christian faith. God has called us into close fellowship with him and equipped us. He really has. He's equipped us with all the tools necessary for that relationship to flourish. However, obstacles stand in our way. Threats from the outside, deceivers from within the church, and even our own hearts can pull us far from the God we love. The questions that stand before us today is simple. Will we love God and love others, even if it means loss for ourselves? Will we, like Christ, give up our rights, our power, and even our lives to show love to our God and our fellow believers? If we will, God has promised us eternal life, and he will help us overcome. So there's the live it out this week. And, um, oh my, okay. The, it says choose a scripture this week to memorize if you'd like. And then here are the ones from the last seven sessions prior to this. There's Second John 8 from last week. Here's the previous week. So we may know him who is true. And that know, remember, is a, it's a personal experience. Session 5. This was the whole purpose, just like it was in John, the the three letters of John. It was written so we might believe in the name of the Son of God and that we would have eternal life. That was the whole purpose. There is session four. We're from God. We've overcome them because greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Session three, there's how we know love. Session two, Don't love the world or the things of the world. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast.